Welcome to the Wings Over New Zealand show with Dave Homewood. To start off with, I always ask uh, for your full name, your rank that you got to, and your service number. Sure. Okay, I'm Peter Tweedy Waller. I um, was a flight lieutenant uh, whilst I served in Vietnam and uh, when I retired, and my service number is uh, 80986. Okay, and your date of birth and place of birth? 23744, and I was born in Auckland. Okay. Um, so, what's your background? You grew up in Auckland? Then? I grew up in Auckland, went to school, all of my school in Auckland, um, and was always keen on aviation. Um, joined the Air Force at age 18 um, for a flying career. Yep. Uh, in fact, I started life on the university course. So I was on number one university course, the first course they ever held. Oh, right. What, what year was that? Uh, 1963. Started. Oh, okay. So that was somewhat frustrating because I actually wanted to go flying and I didn't want to be there, but uh, so I had to wait um, for three years until I did my own wings course and I graduated on number 43 wings course and I was posted to um, 75 Squadron Vampires, okay. where I completed two years. Eventually I was the flight commander there, which uh, as, I, as I was a flying officer was fairly unusual. And from there uh, I went to um, Canberras, I flew Canberras until they were were uh, finally got rid of by the RNZAF and uh, went on to Skyhawks when they arrived. Okay. And uh, from Skyhawks I went and did my tour in Vietnam. All the New Zealand facts were strike qualified, they'd all been on strike the strike force at some stage. Right. And after that I went, uh, when I got back from Vietnam I was um, back at a hockey for only about another three or four months and I got posted to Wigram as an instructor where I um, completed a, a year doing instructing, have an issue instructing and then I resigned and joined in New Zealand. Okay. So just to take you back, um, you, you did your wings course uh, and then went on to the Vampire. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me about um, flying the, 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 the Harvard and your wings course and, and the Vampire. Just give me a little brief. Oh, well, the Harvard was um, uh, a, a very, very good trainer. Um, it had a lot of vices, um, so therefore you had to be um, sharp. It would, it would flick and spin and stall on you if you would mishandle it. Yeah. So from, from, a point, from a safety point of view, um, they don't build them like that nowadays, they design all that out, but uh, from a trainer, training point of view, to teach somebody uh, about uh, what things can happen, it was excellent. So um, the, Harvard wing, the Harvard phase was about, as I recall, about 100 and 120, 130 hours, which included instrument rating, uh, instrument flying and formation flying. And the latter stage of that, the last six months of the wings course was on the Devon, twin engine Devon flying. Right. So did you do any uh, like bombing or gunnery type stuff? Yes, uh, at the end of the Harvard phase we did a weapons course which involved flying to a Harkia where we did um, bombing, low level bombing, dive bombing, low level uh, bombing and um, air to ground guns. Okay, and um, did all the pilots at that stage do the Devon phase as well? Yes, in those days everybody did the complete wings course and um, we were the very first course to graduate. They. Cynically, we, we said, oh, they don't know what to do with us, so they sent us on what they called an operational orientation course, and we were, again, number one. Uh, and they, what we did was we were around all the various bases, and the theory was that they would, you, they would make their decision whether they were finally going to post you after you'd done that course. So we graduated in November, and I don't think we got our final posting till about... Um, the January or so, something like that. Right. So, um, and from that, um, the the various guys who are going to go to various roles went their own way. Okay. And so, when you uh, finished your wings course and you went on to the vampires, you would have had to do a conversion unit. Yeah, did a conversion course on that. The 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 training was um, if you were going to go to helicopters or jets, you went to vampires. If you were going to go to transport or maritime, you went to transport uh, there and then, and some went to 42 Squadron on light transport. So um, four of us went to uh, fly the Vampire Conversion, and um, of those, I was the only one to remain on there. The rest went on to fly helicopters. Okay, right. I guess helicopters at that stage were all the new thing. Everything was new. The um, I mean, the, the aircraft re-equipped in 65, 
we graduated in '66, so everything—the helicopters, the the Iroquois had just arrived, the Sioux were brand, the, the um, Orions and the Hercules were all brand new. Right. And we thought, of course, then that Strike was the next to get the the big feed, but it didn't happen for another few years. Right, right, of course. Um, so you mentioned that you were flight commander uh, on the vampires. Yes. Uh, how did how did that come about? You said you well. Um, Having gone to the university course, I graduated as a flying officer. It was part of the deal. So when I went to, on to Vampires, I was a flying officer then, and um, the guys who were ahead of me um, fairly quickly went on to Canberra's, which is a normal progression. So um, I was left, even though there were other guys there who uh, had been on, Canberra, on Vampires longer than me, they were junior in rank, and um, as time progressed a couple of years later, uh, I was the most senior pilot and we needed a flight commander. I think they realised then that the vampires were short-lived and they didn't have, they didn't want to post someone in uh, to do the job, so um, I was um, made the operational flight commander. So okay. um, we had a training flight and an operational flight and I was the flight commander. Okay. I was, I was, must admit I was a, um, sh shortly did become a, a flight lieutenant anyway, so it wasn't, a, wouldn't have been unusual then. Right, right. So what was it like going from the vampire onto the Canberra? Oh, um, well, let me go back to say, first of all, the Vampire was an absolutely delightful aeroplane. Um, I would say without hesitation that it was the most delightful aeroplane I have ever flown. Um, it didn't have a lot of performance, but it had uh, marvellous handling and it had fantastic visibility. It was very simple and when you were up there, it was like sitting in a big glass bubble all on your own and it was very quiet and um, whilst it, so it didn't perform well, once you got it up to speed, it would rock it along very, very well. So um, that was um, a delight to fly. The Canberra was a much, much heavier aeroplane, um, bigger, it went on great distances, um, it didn't, wasn't manoeuvrable. It was, a, it was a, an interdictor bomber, so it wasn't designed to be a fighter. Um, uh, and um, I was only on the Canberra for um, a little over 18 months before the sky, before they finished and the skyhooks arrived anyway. So it did, because of its range, it did go to inter interesting places. We used to go to Singapore regularly on exercises and take part in those, which were quite a revolutionary change, getting uh, getting up there to operate in another part of the world. Right. Did you do any um, display flying? And I did on the Vampires. I was the number five in the in the aerobatic team, uh, which was also the solo performer. So yes, I had a, um, and really probably about that my. Last six months of what I was there, I was, it was the last vampire team formed, and um, Ross Donaldson was the boss, and he formed a vampire team with five pilots instead of the usual traditional four, and um, yeah, I was number five in the solo. So that was the Yellow Hammers. That was the Yellow Hammers. All right, okay. And uh, then Ross went off to the USA to convert to Skyhawks. He did. He went over to um, Skyhawks in the states. He had an unfortunate accident, hit a duck, and was blinded and didn't fly thereafter. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, the, you went from the Canberra's onto the Skyhawks. Yes. So you were one of the first Skyhawk pilots? Uh, I was certainly one of the initial ones. I was on the second course in New Zealand. I didn't go to the States. The first course arrived back, and then I was on the second course um, as, as it crewed up to get the, 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 the correct manning levels. Okay. So that must have been a bit of a step up going into the Skyhawk? Well, it was a huge step up in terms of modernity, um, even though the, even in those days the Skyhawk was a, an old airframe, but it had a, a hell of a lot more performance than we used to. Um, it was a totally hydraulic controls machine. Um, it was a delta wing, so it didn't, um, it jutted and stalled and didn't, and buffered it a lot, didn't turn like a vampire. But uh, again, it had um, very long legs. It could go a long, long way, as uh, probably almost as far as a Canberra, certainly. Uh, you could, and you could mid-air refuel it, which we learned as techniques. And we had um, a huge range of weapon stores to, uh, that we could carry, which uh, we're talking in 70, 1970. So um, that was sort of the, um, the height of the Vietnam War. And they were being currently used by the Navy bombing up the north, so the weapons ca carried and, and the kind of profiles. And of course by converting to it, uh, we were learning the latest techniques for um, military fighting the, from the, the Americans at the time. Right, of course. Um, so at that stage on the squadron, were you all thinking we might be going to Vietnam? Or? No, um, the, uh, not particularly. Um, the first guys to go were um, Ross Ewing and John Scrimshaw. And I'm pretty sure they went off vampires at the end of the, um, the vampire phase. And, and then I was on Canberra's uh, and um, the guys came and went off Canberra's as they, as they went there. So it wasn't, whilst it wasn't a, um, a put your hand up and volunteer, 
neither was it a um, uh, something that you, they would have forced you to go on you know, they, you, if you had an objection. Okay. It wouldn't have done your career a lot of good, I wouldn't think, but you certainly could have gone out of it, yeah. Right. So when you got told that you were going, mm -hmm. um, tell me about what you were thinking then. Yes, it, it wasn't something that I'd really sort of thought a lot about. Um, um, if, if they had called for volunteers and said, who wants to go, I don't think I would have put my hand up. But by the same token, I recognised that, that I had a responsibility. I joined the RNZF, and if they wished to utilise me in that f fashion, I felt that, that uh, it was part of the contract and the obligation that I had to meet. And by that time, several guys from the squadron had gone over and come back, and so you, oh, yes, you yes. must have had a fair idea of what yes, the work we was. Yes, there, there I'm, I'm just trying to think. I'm not sure that any two pilots served at the same base. The work, in fact, the I wanted to, but I can't remember it was. Um, but the bases they served at were widespread and varied. Um, I was at Da Nang. Um, <clears throat> the guys before me were at Chulai, which is just south of Da Nang. Some guys were right up uh, at Waifu Bai, up by the, North, the DMZ. Some were just down south in, uh, in Tukor. And um, the earlier guys, without a doubt, um, there was a hot war going on. By the time I got there, it was markedly um, um, toned down. Right, OK. So how did you prepare for the tour in Vietnam? I mean, what, what sort of training did you need to do? Well, 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 we were already forward air controllers. There were quite a few of us uh, who were qualified as forward air controllers, um, which we used to do for Army Co-op um, in Harvard. So um, that was essentially it. We were qualified. But of course, when we went to Vietnam, the Americans trained us not only for the type conversion of the airplane, but also for the training for the, the way they wanted the, the job done. OK, and um, tell me about your type con conversion then. Well, um, again, this was a bit protracted. When we arrived um, in uh, South Vietnam, um, we were shipped out um, from Saigon. I just can't remember where we went to start with. I think it was at uh, Cameron Bay. It might have been Phan Rang. It might have been one of those big bases. And they didn't have a course for us. Now, our predecessors, um, Murray Abel and Graham Thompson, were flying OV-10s, and it was a turboprop, and we wanted to fly those. We didn't want to fly the pissy little Cessna. Um, so when we got there, they said, well, you guys are going to be flying Cessnas. And we said, oh, we're not very happy with this. And uh, they had nothing for us to do So for about a week. So we went down to the um, Oak Club at night and we met a lot of the, the senior officers, colonels who were running the, the war from that part of the world. And, they, and, and, and we let them know we weren't overly fussed about flying a Cessna. And we got on very well with them. And they said, OK, well, they changed the postings for us. So they... Um, they changed us to uh, OV-10s and they were, we were going to go to Chulai and fly OV-10s, which made us very happy. So off we went to Chulai. No course available. And we thought, this is a bit strange. They, they seem to be procrastinating a lot. But we went out we went flying in the back seat with some of the guys who were already there. We met the Aussie guys who were all based there and we flew with them quite a lot over their area of operation. And then the Americans um, changed the policy and they said that OV-10s are going to be an out-country out FAC aeroplane only. So uh, part of the government policy was we weren't allowed to operate out country. So we were caught with our own um, problems. We caused it ourselves that we then had to go back to um, to Phan Rang and convert to the um, Cessna 210 or the uh, the, the O2, um, and it delayed our check out probably by a factor of maybe four weeks before we actually checked out. Um, it was our fault that we did that. If we'd shut up and got on with the job as as they wanted, we'd have been out um, much earlier. Right. Okay. Um, so it's a bit of an unusual aircraft in that it's got a push and a pull. It is, engine. yes. So tell me about, was it easy to get used to flying it? or? It's a light aeroplane um, being designed by Cessna. It's virtually viceless. Um, it has no asymmetric uh, thrust problems at all. It's got a problem if you lose one engine, the amount of power it's got available. So the conversion itself was... Um, was um, not at all difficult to, to cope with um, from that from the background that we had. Um, unlike some of the um, American facts who, some of them were just out of UPT, the uh, under, undergraduate pilot training school, um, and some came from co-pilots on things like uh, KCU and 35, so they'd never done any handling. Um, and frankly, they didn't know how to handle an aeroplane, certainly not towards its limits where you were rolling over at 110 degrees of bank and pointing the nose at the ground and firing rockets. It wasn't something that had to come, come across. So they had difficulties, but it was like second nature to us. So the conversion wasn't a problem. Okay. Um, 
So the type of flying that you were doing, uh, was it much different from the forward air control work that you'd done before in the Harvards? Was there a, a huge difference? Yes, because um, most of the um, the flying in South Vietnam at that stage, and we're up, we're out, op, our, our area of operation was at, uh, I say, at Da Nang, to, and the area to the west of Da Nang over towards to Cambodia. Um, the fire bases in the area, many of them had been shut down. Um, there wasn't a lot of activity going on. Um, this, there was certainly, um, and the whole time I was there, I never handled a troops in contact situation. You understand what that is? Uh, if, 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 the troops, if the troops on the ground, the ground soldiers run into uh, an enemy force and they end up with a firefight, um, they may well call on air or artillery to um, relieve the pressure, get them out of it. Um, and that's called the troops in contact. So the troops are in contact with the enemy. Right. And there are various rules and procedures. And that's considered like hot zone stuff because um, often um, you guys are getting sh shooting at the fact as well. So, and the whole time I was there, I never did a t TIC, a troops in contact. Whereas the guys who, um, who preceded me, um, some of them would have them virtually every day, depending on the area they were working in. Certainly have a, a, a great many of them, but uh, it was pretty, it, it, they didn't happen at all. Okay. But so most of our flying, um, and the difference to New Zealand was that we would go out on a visual reconnaissance. And what you're looking for is you, you're flying over an area which you fly over maybe every day. You've got various areas which you think might be areas where the VC are congregating. And you go out looking for differences. You, you don't actually, you don't see people, you don't see guns, you don't see trucks, you don't see anything like that at all. But you might see mud tracks in the river, you might see um, a track in the grass that wasn't there yesterday. And you think, oh, well, something's going on here. Um, so that's, that's the difference. In, in New Zealand, if we went out um, forward air controlling with the army, we would get tasked to go to a certain point and recognise the troops and put in bombs. And it was all, but you weren't going around trying to find those targets for yourself in the first place. All right, all right. Um, can you tell me about the, the weapons that you had on your O2? What? We had two, seven, two, two pods of seven two-inch rockets aside. Now that's the other thing about the O2, the, the, the Cessna 210 in civilian life is quite a sporty little aeroplane. It, I think it flies around about 180 knots. Mm. But the, um, the O2 in uh, military, it, with five radios, two rocket pods, uh, and a full load of fuel, it would only ever do about 105 knots. It was, um, it was pretty sluggish, yeah. So uh, it was quite a different aeroplane the way it handled. So we had these, um, the rockets which we'd use to um, mark targets with smoke. How low would you be flying, generally? The minimum height to fly was 1,500 feet, and uh, it was generally considered that uh, at 3,000 feet you were clear of all small arms fire. And uh, 3,000 feet was a reasonable height to see enough, and you could go down to 1,500 feet for a closer look. That doesn't say that some guys didn't go a hell of a lot lower if they needed to, if they were, you know, some guys were down amongst the weeds. I'm, I've heard anecdotal stories about guys going down 50 feet to check something out, but right. um, um, generally speaking, 1,500 feet minimum, 3,000 feet is the normal operating base. Okay, because I, I recently watched again um, for the first time in years, uh, Back 21. Oh yes. And yes. there was some very low flying in that yes. movie, and as you say, for a particular need, they'd go down to I haven't seen Back 21, I've, I've read the story, I've read the book, but I haven't seen the movie, but I would suspect they have taken a bit of journalistic license to make it exciting. Yeah. Um, you're an easy target. Um, depending on what's shooting at you, um, AK-47, uh, which is what 7.62 millimeter, it's got a 3,000 foot limit, so you're completely safe from that um, there. But anything bigger, 50 cal uh, machine guns, um, the, it, it's not survivable. You get to, you go down at 50 feet. If they've if they've got you and they're tracking you, um, you know, it's it's a pretty dangerous place to be. Yeah. Not not saying that some of them didn't do it and get down there and get shot at, but uh, yeah, you, if you wanted to live a long time, you didn't go there too often. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> what about the living conditions? Um, I've got some photos of my logbook to, to show you there. Uh, crappy. Um, in Da Nang, uh, it, when we went to Chulai, um, we were in, in uh, grass huts, uh, which were in sand dunes. And the Chulai beach is absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's, a, it's a white tropical beach with blue, blue water. Unfortunately, there was a few instances where the VC came in a short night and um, put mines in the sand, so it wasn't frequented too often. 
um, but it was there and it was literally over the over the sand dunes out to one side. So the hooches were um, uh, four man hooches and they were they were uh, quite large, maybe uh, twenty five feet by fifteen to twenty feet wide, and they you'd have a little divided into four, so you had a little alcove there, and they and they just had light camp beds in them, uh, just open windows, uh, grass ro uh, roof. Um, some of them later on were sealed up and made air conditioned because it was pretty humid and sticky. And from there we moved to Da Nang um, uh, and we were uh, actually housed in the um, uh, the officers barracks which was a long concrete building with rooms off one side. It was dark, um, it was hot and it was actually the barracks where in um, I think 1956 the, um, the Viet Cong came through and slit the throats of all the French officers who were in there, so wow. it had a bit of history. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> yeah. How close was your base to the front line? It was, well, there was no front line. Right. Um, it's, it was a different kind of war where, where it was all insurgency, so there had been, in the past, there had been cases where satchel bombs had been thrown over the wire uh, in various bases, rockets, they, they had 122 mil rockets which they used to use, which were an unguided um, rocket, they just, about, I think about um, six miles range, and they just fired those off and they could land anywhere. Um, so there was no front line. Um, some bases in the south earlier on, um, the front line was outside the wire. They, they, they were there all the time and um, you didn't stick your head up uh, and uh, you know, th th there'd, be, there'd be armed guards on the perimeter with, with posts manned with machine guns all the time. As there were in all the bases of course, but uh, Da Nang was a very, very big base and um, they didn't come too close to, uh, to sit that, that we were aware of. Okay. Were you with the other Kiwi that we went, went with you? Um, I was with Graham Goldsmith. That was um, not unique, but it wasn't automatic either. Some of the guys were split, some of the guys were together. Okay. And would you fly different days, or would you fly together? Or? No, we never flew together. It was a, it was a single pilot operation, um, but we often took uh, a new guy who was learning, and just for experience, he might have been waiting for his course, and he'd pick up experience and uh, fly like that. Or observers who wanted to see a particular part of the... Um, the AO, the uh, maybe salami guys, and we'd take them out and have a look. But normally it was a it was a single pilot operation. Right, right. Uh, do you remember the name of the unit that you were flying? With? Yes, the twentieth TAS, twentieth Tactical Air Support Squadron. Yeah. So how big was that unit? Big. Um, there were uh, there were a number of FAC units, um, squad, FAC what we'd call a squadron um, under it. Um, I, I, I it, there'd be hundreds of men. Yeah. Okay. Oh wow, and and it was all O2s or no? Uh, it was OV10s as well. Yep. Uh, they were based in Da Nang. Um, I'm I, I'm I'm not sure if the 20th Task controlled all of the um, Vietnam facts. Facts. Uh, I think the south southern one might have been the 19th Task, but there was yeah, it was a pretty big unit. Okay, cool. But but um, not all congregated together. Um, our own particular unit consisted of of um, the boss who was a major, and um, us ten pilots. And we had our um, a room not unlike this, which was a, a crew room and uh, an, an ops room and a couple of telephones, and that was all we had. And, and you were hooched at various places around the base. Okay, right. Uh, was it um, e easy to get on with the Americans? And, and yeah, yeah, they were easy to get on with. They weren't. Um, they were different, um, certainly. Uh, but yeah, they were. They were the ones that were, the ones that we struck. M most of them were okay. Some of them couldn't get out of their own way. Um, the Pilot standard varied. We considered quite a lot. There were there were some bloody good guys, um, and um, there were some pretty inept guys too. Okay. What did impress us though, there was we used to go over and socialise with um, one of the Phantom Squadrons quite a bit, and they were always happy to see us, and we'd go over there and have a few beers with them and talk to them because we were working these guys um, during the day as well, yeah. and um, there were guys there. This so this was 70, 72 and there were guys there flying phantoms who had been pilots in the Korean War and they'd never flown anything other than high-speed jets. So they were very, very experienced people and um, they, they knew just about everything there was to go. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> um, what, what was the sort of most exciting flights that you did or most interesting? I'd have to... In hindsight, none of it was particularly interesting. Um, there was no... 
what I'd call adrenaline boosting moments. Um, it was so the wall was running down. It was pretty ho hum. Our flying would consist of if they had no tasks for us, we'd go out and do VR visual reconnaissance. Um, quite often uh, they would have pre-planned targets uh, where they would say we want you to go to this grid, this grid reference and bomb this hooch that's there. And um, occasionally. Um, They'd call us up and say there's been a report of such such a place at this go and see what you can find and if you if you see anything worthwhile um, then we can get you some fighters um, that would have been rare and we didn't really find anything worthwhile there was uh, most of the time we're blown away trees um, just in the jungle that you you're, a, a lot of the American intelligence came from these um, sound sensors they used to drop and um, the sensor would pick up a noise. So they'd say, oh, well, we haven't got any troops there, so it must be someone else. So they'd say, well, go and have a look at it, and you might put in a few bombs to see what you can find. And in one, on occasion, you would. You'd, you'd, there'd be a, a sort of a hillside there with some bushes on it. And I remember one day, I, uh, that, that was the target, so we um, hit it with a few bombs. And lo and behold, bunkers were uncovered, several hundred bunkers were uncovered, and there was a secondary explosion. So there was something down there, but most of the time it was I mean, not exciting. You saw no people or anything like that. So. Yeah. So exciting is the wrong wrong word, really. It wasn't. However, the earlier guys, the Kiwi guys, were there. They had some very exciting moments. Some of them. Right, right. So um, when you would go in, you'd find a, a, a target and you'd mark it. Um, would you <coughs> stick around and watch them? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. oh yes. You 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 um, control the whole thing from start to finish. So. Uh, the, fight, the fighters wouldn't release without your clearance. So you're like an air traffic controller. So you'd give them a, um, you'd brief them what, what the target was, uh, the elevation of it, the wind, um, where the best bailout heading was, the attack heading you wanted to um, them to run in on, and uh, then you'd make sure that they uh, could see you. And when they said they could see you, so okay, you roll in, you put a mark in. And you say, um, I mean, you're not necessarily a perfect dartsman every time. You might find that um, you put the one rocket in and it's um, 50 metres short. So you can say, okay, on your boat heading 50 metres along on my smoke. Or you might put in two rockets and say, it's it's midway between the two rockets if you if you, if you had time to do that. Yep. Uh, and as they came in, um, you might say, give me two Mark 82 500 pound bombs. And they'd release two, and, and you'd mark it and say, okay, they were 100 metres left and 50 metres short. So number two would roll in, and hopefully he would correct it um, and um, until the, all the weapons were expended. How many uh, of these operations would you have flown in a week? Or um, You would fly, generally fly every day, um, and, and probably you'd have one day off a week. Maybe you didn't fly, but there'd be, depending on the time of the year, there were quite a lot of weather cancellations. So if you had the early launch in the morning, there'd be, um, a mission was about two and a half hours, and we would aim to have a fact in the air for daylight hours. So the first mission would launch probably at about um, half past seven, and the next one would go about half past nine from 10 o'clock till half past 12, and then 12 o'clock to two, and, and then you'd finish up um, probably about six o'clock at night. So if you were doing the first launch of the day, um, quite often, especially around the Christmas period, the monsoon's coming in, the, the, the cloud and the rain would be clamped right down on the mountains. Uh, it might be okay at the airfield, but if you, can, if you can't climb above 800 feet, you can't get out there and start looking at stuff. So, so you'd cancel that. And it was, that was a pilot decision. you just say weather cancelled. Yep. On, on that issue there, we found a lot of the American pilots weather cancelled fairly frequently um, when we would have been worth having a go and have a look. But, um, okay. Yeah. Did you, apart from Graham Goldsmith, did you come across any other Kiwis? Did you bump into other Kiwis that were there? Um, um, yeah, we um, ran into, we were down in, in Saigon, um, the headquarters staff down there, Major Bruce Meldrum, I don't know if you heard of him, he was a, he became the CGS at one stage. Uh, he was the man in charge down there, and we uh, also came across a, um, uh, I think it was a Kiwi concert party. Yep. Right. So they, they were touring around, so we, uh, we didn't meet them. Okay. What, what were your impressions of Vietnam as a country? I wasn't overly impressed, but then again, in hindsight, um, the, the people... We, we were there as invaders in their country, and um, looking at it from their point of view, I can understand how they were fairly resentful of the Americans and the whole damn thing. Um, and we were tied with the same brush, so, so a lot of them there didn't appear to be overly... Um, they did, certainly didn't look as, as a great saviours. Yeah. Um, 
parts of it were very beautiful. Uh, the, the beaches were gorgeous and um, with the French influence of all of the buildings and the, uh, the French cuisine and the restaurants were the same. They were, they were wonderful. Right. Um, other than that, um, it certainly got raped by the Americans with their um, defoliant um, program and um, their um, bombing by B-52s which devastated huge wide areas and also the massive um, earth machines they used where they just tore the ground to pieces to deny it to the enemy. So, oh, wow. so uh, I guess looking back after you know 50 years of hindsight, well not quite 50 sorry, it's for, what, 40 years of hindsight, um, yeah. you, you see things a bit differently now from then? or In terms of what, being there in the first place? Yeah. Um, Certainly, um, I think the modern um, opinion is that the Yanks should never have been in there, and I'm, I'm not going to argue for or against that. However, the prevailing theory at the time was the domino theory. Are you familiar with that? Where it was going to keep on going. Yes, yep. and um, it, was, it, it has been rejected as a theory. However, um, when you consider that uh, Laos, Cambodia, were all uh, Thailand were all looking at could have potentially gone um, and didn't. So the theory has been discredited, but maybe... If they didn't go communist because they saw the potential outcome um, if they did and what the Americans might be prepared to do. I don't know that they would have, but nevertheless. So I wouldn't dismiss the domino theory entirely in my own, it's my own opinion um, that it's a worthless, worthless theory. But um, um, whether we should have been there, um, the government decided to send us there in support of the Americans. Um, certainly the South Vietnam government was very corrupt. Um, but then again, the North Vietnamese government was very determined to conquer the whole country and uh, make it the whole thing communist. So um, I think certainly from talking to people, Vietnamese people, uh, who have, uh, under the, they had no wish to become communists and they wouldn't have had that option, uh, had, had the, as ultimately they didn't anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah. What happened sooner? Yeah. But Unbelievable what? amount of corruption going on there. Right. Um, with the, um, you know, we, we would see things, you know, that there'd be shorter supplies, but it was all being sold in the black market, and um, um, there were pretty high level officers in, in the Vietnamese military who were making a great deal of money out of it. After the war, uh, I know for a long period, um, and particularly with the U in the USA, but um, but I think even here, there was a, a backlash from the public against the... Oh, absolutely. Uh, and did you feel that too yes, as a pilot? Yes, absolutely. I, mean, I can recall coming home. Um, um, uh, when, I, when I left Vietnam, as I mentioned, my wife was, um, was pregnant. She was about she was due to produce very shortly. Yeah. So I, um, uh, when we finished our tour, we had, we had a date, which was your end of tour in Vietnam. And um, you didn't fly after that date. And it was going to be something like... Um, a week before I could get down to uh, Singapore and another few days before Herc was coming up to take me back home and uh, that was going to be sort of past birth date so I went down to Saigon and I called to spoke to Bruce Meldon and said look this is a scenario how about an indulgence ticket on Air New Zealand and he said hmm okay uh, which I was very very grateful for and I went actually down the, I think about two days later in an Australian Herc to Sydney and then I caught the Air New Zealand flight home. When I arrived home, I was travelling in uniform, of course, and um, they, where have you been? And the reaction from customers when I came through was less than civil. Um, uh, I would have thought they would have, you know, I mean, I really had no experience of this. I would have thought coming back from a war zone, they'd say, you know, welcome back and pleased to see you made in one piece. But they were less than civil. Um, that was a fairly minor occasion. Um, the same thing happened when they, when our baggage arrived, which came by Hercules about two weeks later, and we had to go back and clear it. Again, uh, customs were um, positively rude in terms. It was like you know, they were, you're, you shouldn't have been there, so they they were pretty anti. But uh, a friend of mine um, who um, served before me, when he came back, he uh, he went to you to um, back home to Gisborne with his dad to the RSO. And they wouldn't serve him. Wow. Mm. And his father said, well, if that's the way you feel, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm never coming back. And in fact, uh, unfortunately, you can't interview him because he died because he was affected by Agent Orange. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so, 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 so and, we, and we discussed it um, amongst ourselves. And um, my wife said when she was uh, in Auckland, she went back home from a hakia with a parent. She had one, she had one little one who was, my son was about... Um, 
70 or 18 months when, when uh, she was nearly full term. And uh, so she went back to Auckland and, and her parents um, helped her out there. And she went to work um, in the last three or four months as a temp. And um, the other woman saw her, she was a young woman who was obviously heavily pregnant. And um, they said, well, where's your husband? And she said, he's in Vietnam. And there was, oh, and they didn't speak to her anymore. Wow. They cut, sort of cut her out. And she said she felt it um, quite severely. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. It really is. I mean, I don't think younger people like myself and younger uh, still just don't realise that kind of feeling that there was. Well, I think that opened the world's eyes. Um, I think I think in America, especially and ultimately here too, not only the public but the government said, if we're going to send our men to do this, we'll at least have to honour them when they come back. Yeah. And I think you see now, it's the exact reverse uh, from the um, Middle East and with America as they come back and they're... They, they hold their heads up proudly. Absolutely. And it's also interesting seeing uh, these days at uh, Anzac Day how, how many kids are turning out. Absolutely. Uh, when I first went to Anzac Day, I was 14, and, yep. and there was like three teenagers there, yep. including me. You know, it's like now there's the whole school will turn out. Exactly. It's yep. amazing. Yep. Um, I, I talk a lot with um, particularly World War II veterans, mm -hmm. and, and they say that there's this period where after World War II, Nobody wanted to really talk about it, but they were considered, you know, the heroes come yes, back. Yes, yes. And, and then when the Vietnam thing came around, even they got bad pe feeling from the younger generation, you know, the, the anti-war people. Uh, I remember one particular uh, chap, he lives here in Cambridge, he said he was down in Wellington for an Anzac Day parade, and um, these uh, young hippies, as he called them, came over and started protesting. So all these World War II generation guys were in their 50s, um, turn around and beat the crap out of them. Okay, yeah. Yeah. good on them. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. he said that was in Wellington, in the, yeah. in the central city. And, um, you know, things like that where, you know, they were picking on the World War II guys mm. for, I mean, nothing makes any sense, really. Just on that same thing, um, I have heard, again, anecdotal instances of the World War II guys regarding the Vietnam guys said, oh, you guys weren't in a real war and it was disgusting anyway. So, so they, they, uh, they also denigrated the Vietnam veterans. Absolutely. I've heard that myself. Uh, I was selling poppies here a few years ago and a lady came up and um, she said, I'll never buy a poppy for the RSA. And I said, why is that? And she said, my husband was in Vietnam as a doctor and he got killed. And I, and I was struggling. I had three kids. I went to the RSA to, for help and they said, oh, he wasn't in a real war, so we can't help. Yeah. He was yeah. killed. Exactly. You yeah. know? Yeah. So, well, the RSA, of course, um, um, apologised when they had um, tribute 2006, the march in Wellington, when Helen Clark apologised. The, the, the um, chief of the RSA, who was an ex-Air Force guy, Robin Plitcher, um, he uh, stood up and publicly apologised for the way the RSA had treated the Vietnam veterans. Isn't it? Um, it it's, it's interesting because he was a Vietnam veteran of himself. So he, he was there. I don't uh, know if he was. He was. He was there on the helicopters with Nice. Oh, he was. Helicopters, yeah, yeah. of course. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So it, it, really, it took one who had actually been there to, yes. to make the apology. Yes. Incredible, really. Um, yeah, that's a, it's, a crazy, it's a crazy war, but everything else around it is crazy. And, well, I think all wars are crazy. I mean, uh, I, I don't think you have to be getting older to realise that there are, there are really no winners. Um, and so, you know, if you want to go to war, it better be a last ditch thing. And, and the other thing is, you better bloody win. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, it's the whole lot's in vain. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, this is a, a useless fact, do you know how many men were killed in Vietnam? Uh, uh, talking American servicemen? Around about um, 27,000 over the course of the war. Do you know how many, how many people in the period of the Vietnam War were killed in motor accidents in the United States? 29,000. Wow. More were killed in road accidents than there were in, in the war. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. That's incredible. Mm. Yeah. Um, are there any other sort of areas that I've missed that you want to talk, tell about or record? Uh, no, I could tell you about, there was one instance, I mean, there were... Um, it was, a, it was a funny way of doing business that I, I thought. Um, they would have, in the, in the South, they would have a local headman, and he was the go-to guy that the Americans would go to, and he would say whether this was a friendly village or an enemy village. And, um, I mean, the helicopter guys would be flying around, and suddenly they might get shot at from the, from the bush or from the edge of the jungle. So 
there might be a village in fairly close proximity. So they go to this headman and they say, is this a friendly village or an enemy? And if it wasn't positively friendly, it was automatically enemy. That might have been absolutely nothing there whatsoever. But unless he, uh, unless he said, no, we have friendly troops in the area, it became automatically an enemy village and automatically uh, um, an, an acceptable target. And one day I went out to uh, there and the, the guys, uh, the, the helicopter guys had taken ground fire from a, the line of jungle. And there was a, a little village with maybe five hooches, um, I'm trying to think from memory, maybe 200 metres away. And um, it was probably a passing group of Viet Cong who saw a helicopter and shot it. But um, was, they said to the village, to the, um, the local uh, boss there, is it a friendly village? He said, no, not a friendly village, which automatically became an enemy village. So they sent me out there with a couple of phantoms to uh, destroy it. Well, whilst I was out there waiting for the phantoms to arrive, um, a woman came out with, with a little child in, his, in her arms and went to the well and pulled up a bucket of water and went back in the hooch. And I thought, I ain't bombing this. Now, it might have been a very clever ploy by the Viet Cong, I don't care, but um, I didn't do it, so I, I said no, no. So I moved the target um, to the tree line about five or 600 metres away and bombed the shit out of that right. and probably killed a lot of trees and made matches out of it, but uh, <laughs> at least I sleep at night. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, did you have your own um, personal ground crew assigned to your aircraft? Or? Uh, no, we had a we had a squadron and we had our, we had a uh, our own set of aeroplanes with our own set of ground crew, crew on it, but uh, just like just like back home. But, yeah. uh, no, 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 no. But being unique, we being Kiwis, of course, they painted Kiwis on our on our aeroplanes with our names, and um, yeah, we got on very well with the ground crew. We found that it was it was a different. We in New Zealand, the 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 pilots respected the the ground crew probably. Um, a little more. There was more integration than what the, what is in with the American forces, right. and of course, being essentially not tourists, but at least the different people, we we could break those barriers down a lot more easily than probably the Americans could. But there's no consequences of it. Yep. Gotcha, gotcha. When you got back to the squadron um, after your tour, did you go back to seventy five? I went back to seventy five. Yes. And did the other guys kind of treat you differently, like a, like you're the you're the veteran now? Or? No, no, there was nothing really different. There'd been enough guys go before. Um, we did have a, a it was an automatic thing that um, I gave a talk on what I, on what my tour was like, and it was everyone's tour was different. They're in a different part of the country, and and um, it was pretty ho hum because it was pretty uninteresting in comparison to. You know, I, I don't think I was ever shot at, to my knowledge. I never, never had any bullet holes in my aeroplane. So, um, you know, no, no, life just progressed as normally and um, picked it all up until I got posted off to uh, to Christchurch for the uh, wings course okay. as instructor. Yep, OK. Uh, the one thing I was going to mention, my wife said you should tell him that, it was about um, post-traumatic stress. And um, I don't consider I suffered from post-traumatic stress at all. However, I mean, whilst we're over there, there were a couple of cages when rockets came in and they scared the bejesus out of you. These, these, you'd be lying in bed asleep at night and there's an explosion and the sirens go off and the searchlights go on. You think, what the hell, where's the next one coming? Because you didn't know. Yep. So when I got back home to, um, to Auckland, uh, my wife was still intact and we were in bed downstairs in her parents' house there. And I don't know, 11 o'clock and I sound asleep. Anyway, um, a car in the street outside backfired. I was out of bed and under that bed before I even woke up. Wow. And, and um, I, if you'd have asked me, I'd have said, uh, no, I don't have any, I'm asleep. <laughs> and my wife sat up and said, what's wrong with you? And I sort of sheepishly got back up and said, oh, don't worry about it. I've never had it since, but I mean, I recall that quite clearly. It, was a, it surprised me. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> um, that's actually quite good that you didn't suffer... Um, I don't think I was stressed enough. There was, it wasn't an area where I was fa forced into... Um, I don't, uh, to my knowledge, none of the facts uh, suffered any, nor the helicopter pilots suffered any post-traumatic stress, um, whereas I do know some of the soldiers who served there absolutely did. There's, there's no two ways about it. Yeah. And I got a friend who was on the wing schools with me who, who did suffer from that. He was a helicopter pilot in there and he got shot down, and he did suffer from post-traumatic stress, no two ways about it. But I don't recall any of the helicopter guys having any problems with their later life. Certainly the facts didn't, as far as I'm quite sure of that. Right, okay. Um, did you know, when you were coming back, did you know that you were the last rotation? No. Oh, uh, well, not, not when we went. Um, by the time we, um, I suppose, a couple of months ago, uh, they, they advised that there would be no more going, yes. Okay. 
So we were the we were the last, not only the last facts, we were the last combat personnel in Vietnam. The army had gone home, and there was a headquarters unit in Saigon which stayed there for another couple of months. But we we're the last combat, the last two combat guys. Wow, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Someone had to be last. Yeah, turned the lights out. <laughs> yeah, because the Yanks stayed on for another um, what another three years, mm. and things got a bit terse because uh, the, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong were coming closer and closer, and they. They were bringing the fight in the more and more. There was, probably, there was probably a lot more stuff going on then. Yeah, I, um, I was actually thinking before when you were saying that the time at the time when you were there, everything was um, fairly calm and and it was yeah, almost... in our AO. Right. Yeah. Um, the the um, the DMZ was only uh, fifty miles or so north of Da Nang, and of course the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down the side into Cambodia and down the western side of AO. It wasn't in our AO, it was in Cambodia. And then it, 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 it turned east again, um, a bit north of Saigon and came inland there. So those areas there were still having firefights going on and, and, and ground troops getting into contact regularly. But uh, in our AO, just with that bulge was, there wasn't a hell of a lot going on. Right, okay. Yeah. Um... I can't really think of anything else at all to ask. But all right. Yeah, I think cover most of the things for you. Yeah, yeah, it's been really, really interesting. Uh, okay. Really good. Um, oh, actually, the one last thing: uh, the Air Force Museum has an O2. Uh, it does on display. It I does. Just wondering what you thought about. Uh, well, it's not my airplane, but it's fine. I think it's got uh, Graham Goldsmith's name on the side of it. I think it has, yeah. Because he was a, ended up as a um, an air commodore, so he was going to uh, wear vice marshal, I think, and so. He, he, I think he did the arrangements to get it from the I think States. he did. I think he yeah. organised it as well, yes, yes. Yeah. It's good to see it um, represented, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they'll get an OV-10, because I don't know. I think there was only maybe, there were 14 of us, and I think there might have been four or maybe six flew OV-10s only, so, yeah. yeah. Is that one regret that you never got to fly that? Oh, yes, absolutely. It would have been, um, uh, had a lot more power, had a lot more firepower. It had guns, um, and... Um, I did fly, um, I don't know how many hours, maybe 30 hours in the back seat of one, okay. and I flew it with the, the Australian guys. But, um, yeah, no, it was, it was an aeroplane which was built for the job, of course. Yeah, very and, cool. and, and a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the guys who flew at out country had pretty exciting lives. <laughs> and, in fact, I, I, I was talking to... Um, one of the Australian facts who preceded us home, he was he was at Chulai and uh, he said he he did one he went way out west one one mission and uh, he dived in on the target and he had a guy in the back seat another pilot in the back seat and um, a machine gun a large caliber started opening up from the, at them as they were rolling into the target and he saw him trace the fire out to the right so he, he grabbed the stick and bank left and the stick wouldn't move. So they pulled out level, and when he got bang, he said, just the stick wouldn't move. And the guy said, yeah, because I was pushing it. I looked out to the left, there was tracer fire out there, so I'd go in that way. So he went down between the streams. So they did, they did see stuff from time to time, but I say uh, it wasn't our time to see it. Right, right. I cannot say that I'm regretful of that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a hero. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that's, um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, right, Peter. That's really good. Cheers. All right. That was the Wings Over New Zealand show with Dave Homewood.